Good afternoon. Are you all fired up after that talk? Yes? All right. But well, we're going to keep that conversation and the energy going with this next panel, uh, focusing on the business model. So we're going to go in, thank you for setting up uh, that, that conversation. We're going to go in deeper into what that actually means and what we're experiencing. And what are the, also the opportunities to not just do business as usual, as we've seen these extractive models continue to undermine a lot of the, the equity that is needed in order for any of this technology to really matter. Uh, into the why. So with that said, my name is Lily. I'm uh, the Chief Tech Community Officer of the Caper Foundation. For the folks that know where, who we are, raise your hand in the back. Yes, excellent. We're proudly based in, in Oakland, California, and we do national work across the tech ecosystem, centering racial justice and technology. And today's panel, we are, uh, you can see their names back here, but I'll go ahead and, and just say a, a quick thank you so much for being here. We have Provost Vincent Del Casio, San Jose State's Provost and Senior Vice President for the Academic Affairs. We have Sylvester Johnson, Founding CEO of Corporation for Public Interest Technology, and Yad Oren, the Managing Director for SAP Labs US and Global of SAP B BTB Innovation. We're going to have to talk about what that means because that is a long title and I'm super curious. Uh, with that said, we'll, the conversation that we'll have and, and we'll save a little bit of time for uh, questions from you all, specifically around what are some of the challenges, right, as we just heard the, the narrative of the myths, the truth, but also the, the things that seem to be at odds uh, regarding how do we actually have more sustainable business models that aren't hurting and continuing to divide the communities, um, specifically the role that technology is playing in that, in that area with on the products and the people and the, the planet in itself. So with that said, why don't we get started with the first question, because I know we want to jump right in, especially right after lunch. Um, is it possible to really start to build tech that does no harm, or is that too idealistic, especially in these capitalistic structures that we're currently in and continue to be uh, where profit at all costs seems to be the driving factor? But what are those structures that need to be in place so we can have a different conversation and have different models that really need to meet this moment? So we'd love for you to get a sense from you all. How are you approaching this from your own work, especially the, the, the initiatives um, looking for, right? Like the elephant in the room is the election that we just had, the results, the reality of what that entails and how do we move forward? So with that, we'll go ahead and, and get started um, right here with you all and then we'll go down. All right, small question. No problem. How do we overcome uh, capitalist impulses in five minutes? Go. Ready, no. so we're counting. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, no, it, um, you know, very interesting. For me, um, I've actually, I'm the provost, but I'm, uh, I'm also been working at the intersections of technology and robotics and human labor questions for quite some time. And for me, the, the interesting thing at the first level that I think we need to struggle against if we're going to continue to intervene from a policy perspective is we've been too fast to give over intelligence. We've been too fast to give over smart. We've been too fast to lose the human in the human computer interaction. And I think when you see the space of intelligence, you fail to recognize ourselves in the technologies. And when you do that, then you, then you remove the responsibility question. And when all that happens, I think that's a really important question. And you know, I'm a geographer by training, and you think about smart cities, people talk about smart cities all the time, as if they're acting on us without any of our involvement whatsoever. And meanwhile, we're in the process of building those things ourselves. So that question for me of how you do no harm is we have to first and foremost maintain our responsibility and our authority. I'll give you a very practical example being in this valley. And it's, it's an interesting place to be in public education with a really good price point, with a lot of students, a lot of first generation. I've been in companies and dis, it, in this valley and despite conversations like, oh, I don't know, you know, do you have any responsibility for what's gone on in the public discourse? And you still hear, no, our job is just to build the platforms. You know, the responsibility is out there. And so a lot of those organizations have ceded that responsibility. And so what we have to do is claim it back. And I think that starts with that very question. At the same time, I have an optimism about what technology can do. I've done studies and research with colleagues 
on technological sovereignty movements and taking tech back in places like Barcelona, the role of robots in working with people with autism. There's all these amazing things going on, but I think at the very heart of it, we have to maintain our connection and responsibility, and that's what I think is the priority for higher ed. And, and yet, I think especially, uh, it's very important to have the, the private sector insights because it feels that we're living in very asymmetrical sites of information where a lot of the innovation is behind closed doors and that we just experience it without being able to have a little bit more transparency. So wondering from your perspective, being at SAP, please um, give us some of that insight, especially as how you all are approaching it. And then also please explain what your title really means and what you're yeah, doing. <laughs> So we are a German company, so long title, pretty complicated, but I'm very happy to be here and, and thank you for having me. I, yeah, I have two roles in SAP. I've been with the company for 20 years. Believe it a lot, it's considered youngster in SAP. Uh, one of them, I'm the managing director of FS, SAP Labs in the US, where I oversee the development operation of the 5,000 individual we have across 14 locations, building product, especially around innovation, AI, and cloud. We are, we are a European company. So of course, we need to pay premium for the expensive US developers, only if they can bring something new with AI, cloud, and so forth. Also, we oversee the engagement with universities, so I'm very, very happy about the relationship we have with the uh, San Jose University. And the second role is the R&D lead, right, for BTP, which is the business technology platform, is the platform of the software, like the engine of the car, if you will. Um, and as you can spot by the long hair and the beard, I'm a developer geek, right? So I'm an R&D lead. I, I don't often uh, wear a suit, right? My wife told me to <laughs> send a picture. But we are building the AI product. So I am part of the people making the sausage, and this is why those questions are super, super relevant. Um, we also have another teams. We discussed yesterday, like a couple of hundred people doing quantum computing and other, but AI is the core development that, uh, thing that we are doing. And for us, there are three elements that when we look to AI, and it's very important, why I'm very happy also to, to be involved in, in these kind of forums. As a European companies, uh, we are considered very advanced with our understanding about privacy and reliability, and Vincent, what you said, responsibility. Uh, I, I can tell you already, the AI we are building, the company is doing well. We have beat quarter after quarter, but the AI is not sexy like, uh, you know, jumping avatar. We are building, we are the leading company for enterprise application, how you automate finance, how you improve supply chain, how you create, uh, you know, ed education and learning for employees. And the point, because um, we learn a lot about what's going on in Europe, what to do and what not to do as well, uh, we came up with uh, three R formulas, how to approach AI that can be lucrative, help the economy, but also be very important for democracy and society. The first R, I'm gonna keep it very short, is relevant. Um, as you said, uh, AI is a great technology. But it's also the generative AI, which is the fourth generation of AI. It's quite expensive. It's not always that sustainable. It's a lot of GPUs, right? God bless the Silicon Valley. But you need to make sure you have a real business problem you can solve with this technology. Otherwise, you sometimes shoot a fly with a cannon. So it needs to be relevant. Solve something that justifies the use of this, this power. The second R is the reliability. Um, the technology itself is not always accurate. There are many challenges, and many companies need to build things below the iceberg, not only what's happening and the user interact, but how you can make sure there are algorithms that can optimize the data that you have, how you can make sure that you are, you know, um, correct biases and other things that happening. This involves, and this is what we are very proud in doing as well, building some AI cops as well that kind of govern the reliability. And the last R is also responsibility. It goes to ethics, it goes to IP violation. So the relevant, reliable, and responsible is kind of the formula for impactful and relatively harm-free AI. And the bottom line, I will say, we built a lot of the technology around the last two R, how you can remove the bias, how you can make sure IP is being protected or reported if there is violation, and how we can also make sure data is accurate and, and other things like that. So we are focusing on the three R's. And there are many works we are doing in order to build algorithm, not only to the capitalism and improving the productivity, but to make sure that we are, have a really risk-free society eventually. Thank you so much for that. And we'll come back, because I know uh, diving a little bit more into some of these business structures and some of the evolving ones. And, and Sylvester, that's what you've been doing. So now you've been in the space of uh, higher education, uh, being in the public, private sector, and then now you're a founder. 
being the founding CEO of the Corporation for Public Interest Technology, what are you seeing? And can you tell us a little bit more about um, the, the public interest technology space and how it's been evolving? And could it actually be that tech can do no harm? Or what are, the, you know, let's have the real talk conversation on that part. Yeah, no, thanks uh, so much, Lillian. Great to be here and to uh, have this conversation. Uh, so, yeah, our startup, the Corporation for Public Interest Technology, is a public benefit company. Uh, my co-founder, Bill Ingram, and I uh, just launched this recently, and we've done so uh, very much as a product of this consortium and this ecosystem. And we've drawn on uh, the very humanistic talent and technical talent to put together our startup team. Uh, can, can you create technology that does no harm or that does good? I, I think that we can create things with technology in the ways that we can create things with other sectors and other types of institutions. You know, you could ask this about education. Can, can, can we do education in a way that is, that is positive and that it's not harmful? And we know the history of higher ed institutions that used to exclude people and were responsible for supporting things like eugenics and all of that. And we've also seen the ability of education to transform our society and provide a bridge for people to be able to fulfill their potential. And so I don't think technology is special as a sector of our society. I think it's a human thing. And I think we have to think about it the way we, we think about other human practices and other human institutions. And so I would certainly want to elevate the importance of having uh, the, because it's a human practice, who are the humans? You know, do we have comprehensive talent? So our startup is uh, very much emerging out of uh, a team that is some of us are, are like I, or they're people coming from humanities or humanistic disciplines or humanistic sectors and others who are technically uh, experts in their areas of skill or who bridge those areas. I think we have to change the narrative about what technology is because we've been saying for decades that technology is about technical. It's about technical expertise, technical skills, let the math majors, nothing against math majors. I was a chemistry major in <laughs> undergrad. Uh, but but the, let the math majors be responsible for designing things. They know how to code. Uh, they know how to do engineering. And then the rest of us, we can write about it. You know, when it comes out, maybe we can have a conference on it. And the reality is that we've told the wrong story. And the, the biggest technology challenges that we have to figure out are actually on the human side. And it's the things that most of us read about usually when we see the debates about technology. They're about equity. They're about privacy. They're about how we're going to govern it. And so if we take seriously that human nature of it, we need comprehensive talent. So can we do that? Sure, we, we can do that. Uh, we, can we have inclusive talent? Right? Can we make sure that we, we're drawing on uh, not just a token level of representational diversity, but true, richly inclusive, diverse teams? We have, we have that population of people around us. We can create access for them to participate. So we, we try to take that very seriously in defining our teams. And then there are other things that, that we have to do to create our capacity for technology to be beneficial and helpful. And that is we, we also have to make sure that we're being accountable to the right kinds of outcomes. So we, we are products of what we incentivize. And we have to create more diversity and creativity in the way that we fund the ability of these enterprises to be able to launch. Not everything has to create a, a, a million percent return, all right? Not everything has to be a hockey stick. Uh, we, can, we can create more pathways for impact investing while still also holding up uh, return on, on money capital, but also incentivizing other things. So we're capable of doing that, but it means we have to change. You know, we have to change the way we educate talent. We, we can't, mo most high schoolers don't already have in their head until we put it there, <laughs> that if they're interested in technology, that that means they should be studying democracy. But what we have done as a society is to bring people through our educational institutions. If they want to go into technology, we, we tell them you have, that means studying engineering, for example. We create the curriculum, we don't even allow them time to study inequality, to study democracy, to study cultural systems. But when they graduate from our institutions, after we finish producing them, and they create their companies, and they create their products, we vilify them for what they've not paid attention to. And we claim that they're destroying democracy. But we created them. They didn't come from Mars. They came from our institutions. 
And so we have to take responsibility for how we're creating the future of talent. And we've got to train it differently because those students are not creating the curriculum. Our institutions are creating that curriculum. And I think our legislative assemblies have to stop defunding comprehensive education and stop vilifying technology and start to take accountability for how we are creating the people. We're telling them what skills they should have. And then when they do what we train them to do, you know, we accuse them of doing something wrong. So all of that has to change. And I think if we, if we take those changes seriously, yeah, absolutely. We can create much better outcomes. We can have much more healthful systems of technology impact. Thank you so much. I think that that deserves an applause for the thoughtfulness of it. So thank you. And it really sets up uh, a really great uh, uh, question for Vin, especially um, at Central State State University. Uh, you all just launched the new college for information and data science. So on that point, how is that uh, college being, now that it's launched officially, also doing things differently? How can um, you are, are creating opportunities that are also market relevant, but not so driven by the market that that's all we're really doing? Yeah, uh, I just have to say Sylvester uh, nailed it and, and Yad said so many amazing things already um, tied to this. So one of the things that we have done extremely well in higher education is discipline knowledge. And what I mean by that is create disciplinary nodal points. So one of the things you didn't mention but I think is critical is accreditation itself. So engineering colleges are accredited in a very particular way that don't allow space for any of the things you're, you're talking about. And so for us, the new College of Information, Data, and Society, and the society piece is critical in there, is the question that information is at the core of almost every single question that we now ask. And it is an interdisciplinary conversation, maybe even a transdisciplinary one. And I'm a trained geographer, I love my discipline, I love my people, but at the end of the day, I stood up five years ago on a stage and I gave a talk called There's No Such Thing as Big Data to provoke the question, right? Like, why do we keep giving over our data? And I think the disciplining of knowledge has now become an, a hindrance. The challenge for higher ed then is how do we respond? How do we create nodal points around the institution where we can focus on the question of information and bring all this amazing talent to that question. And so the new college is meant to do some of that and transcend some of the classic boundaries. And those people, and I, Eric is in the back, and recently here, you know, in the iSchool movement, have been doing this for quite some time. But comprehensive public institutions like San Jose State haven't. And I'm excited to see us lead in that space with the amazing students we have to really challenge them to think about the problems in front of them and how they're gonna grab exactly what Sylvester's talking about or even engage with companies and be ready to work in, a, in an amazing organization like SAP and have authentic partnership at the same time. So I think we have to really acknowledge the kind of structural impediments to some of the things that we have created internal to higher education, and we have to think differently about how we organize knowledge and even how we teach so that we can be more nimble and address the problems because they're coming at us so quickly now. They're just one after another, and our, our organizational structures are not necessarily ready to do that. So this college and the kinds of things we're trying to think about, even beyond that with expansion of programs in computer science and linguistics and computational oceanography and bioinformatics. The kinds of things we're trying to develop are really critical thinkers around that who can do exactly what Sylvester's organization is pushing us to do and rightly pushing us to do, I think. Super helpful, especially on, on that evolving of what's being taught, how it's being taught, the applications. Yeah, this question is for you, especially um, to give a little bit going back to what you mentioned, the four R's, especially double uh, clicking on the responsible part of building the products. Wondering what that actually looks like from the developer or from the multidiscipline teams all the way through, through the entire organization. And what would you like to see the broader private sector do that maybe SAP is already doing or that you would like the industry to move towards ensuring that we're building more responsible technology from conception all the way through when it's out in, in the market. No, definitely, and there are three, three points here. First of all, it all starts from a very responsible company culture. I think corporates also need to understand we have a bigger responsibility there. 
I'm going back to the European angle. Um, also, if you remember in 2018, there was the JDPR regulation about data privacy, that you can anonymize and have the right to be forgotten in databases. The point is that SAP also, even before it was mandated and regulated, like we tried to do to AI in the States and we are very progressing in Europe, even before there was fine, 4% fine from the turnover if you don't do this, we came together made ethical consortium and other to try to approach this because it's the right thing to do, right? You want to be there as a trusted partner for your companies. We have more than half a million enterprising on SAP. So the point number one is having a culture of, like Sylvester said, like critical thinking, understanding democracy and have some values. You know, and we also we teach a lot about leadership in academias. The values eventually is also selfishly good for company growth but you need to have these values to understand all things as well. From technology point of view, as I briefly mentioned earlier, we need to measure, of course you need to, you cannot progress with anything you don't measure. Also the work and the algorithm you build to correct the bias, to do things that promote responsibility. Not only the top line and bottom line of revenue, but how much biases you were proven to remove from recruitment processes of how much bias and or IP violation you were able to remove from you know, marketing creation software. You need to measure also on those kind of elements in the leadership level if you truly have the right values. And the third point <coughs> sorry, is about championship from the C-level executives. This is true for any big initiative in companies, but in very simple words, it's very important that the CEO of the company or the CTO, um, she will be behind us and will help to drive this. So it's all about the values and shaping the company culture. There are so many big books written about this. The measurement of doing this as well, putting this as part of your R&D system, and everything starts and ends in the company leadership, championship. If they talk about it, if they are recognized with this, usually it turns out really well. I think that's such an important perspective, making sure that we're holding the leaders, the leadership responsible of across through, especially as how some of those business decisions and the trade-offs are being made. And, and, and this question's for you, Sylvester, because this kind of brings in both, both of these perspectives together where you're working at the intersection of public, private, institutions, startups. So wondering from your perspective, what are some of those biggest opportunities that startups or even the nonprofits uh, could be partaking in specifically to work together? What, are, what, what is it the stakeholders that maybe haven't been invited to the table but are really critical for us moving forward and how are you approaching that with the organization? Yeah, I think one of the, the greatest opportunities is that there is much more a public understanding of or a perception of the need to tackle the impact that technology is having. Uh, and so we, we've heard this indicated time again throughout our gathering for this conference and that is the, the biggest fights that we're having over the technology concern its ethical uses and impact, uh, the way that it's shaping society. There, there are questions of governance, rich, large, not government, but how do we govern ends? How do we manage this technology? Right? And so the, the logical answer to that is that we need much more expertise from people who are uh, very much pit-oriented uh, in, their, in their skill level and their knowledge set, that they understand issues of inequality, that they know a lot about social systems and cultural systems, that they understand how human behavior functions and that you have to keep that in mind when you're designing things, uh, that we need to have that approach to trying to regulate technology. So if you think about the people who are, in, who are committing their work to the nonprofit sector, those are people who are publicly minded. Uh, they're, they're trying to work in the public interest and we need more of those people to participate in leading technology, broadly conceived. So that, that perception, that understanding, or that legibility of the human side of technology problem is pointing to these openings for uh, people who value public interest, who understand the importance of elevating to the highest levels the health of civic institutions and democratic outcomes to create products and services through partnerships, business to business relationships, uh, in order to, to provide something that is more ethical, 
that is much more aligned with the needs and concerns, particularly, not only, but particularly of highly vulnerable populations. And so we are, uh, one of the, the nice things that's happened even at this meeting is that we were able to, uh, to have a conversation among multiple social justice tech stakeholders about how we can do something together. How can we coordinate our efforts in order to, to be more collaborative in the commercial space so that we can design things and create things and make things that have that accountability. I think that opportunity exists now more than it ever before in the sense that it's easier for people to recognize that need. Now, it's, it needs to be supported. <laughs> and, and it also, there needs to be more funding for things to start up in this direction and, and to take flight. And yet, uh, despite all that's happening in our society, nationally and globally, I'm, I'm ever more inspired and excited by the fact that we have these gatherings, that we have the ability to be strategic together to figure out how do we coordinate our efforts so that you get that multiplier effect, so we can produce something in the commercial space uh, and drive revenue opportunities to nonprofits so that they don't have to just depend on grants. They, they can have revenue generating practices that are extending and that are scaling in a B2B environment where they can have these structured relationships with other partners that enhance their own ability to create value. So that, that's how we're trying to operate as a startup. You know, we, we wanna be very collaborative and very cooperative. And again, I think it's very much uh, a, a, an amazing opportunity that Pitt is, this consortium is giving rise to the ability to foster those connections. I love that aspiration because you, you, you literally answered what my next question was going to be, especially in this moment where we want to be able to bring that uh, opportunity to aspire, even though feel, things feel really uh, dark at the moment and just coming out from this week in general. But just looking at a global perspective five to ten years from now, from an, um, putting on your most optimistic perspective and aspirational what are some of those new investments? What are those types of moonshots? Where the public, private, specific, the public interest technology that we should be investing in? And, and how do we do that? So we'd love to start with Ben, and then we'll just go down to just share what, what's that um, opportunity where we can use the best of humanity and, and technology? And what would be your moonshot, Ben? We live in a society of open source. I mean, to me, like the, the, the space to co-create, to honestly understand the algorithmic logics that undergird the things that are driving our worlds right now and being able to capture that. And I think what an organization like this has the opportunity, we talked earlier about, you know, transgressing the boundaries of uh, different types of organizations and so forth. If we could co-build and do what Sylvester and Yad are talking about responsibly and ethically together and, un and undergird that with that, those ethical principles that people should know about their data. They should understand their rights and engage in that. That would be the right thing to do. And I can tell you, like, and I love the entrepreneurial energy of this valley, but I got six emails this morning from ed tech firms that want to sell me something, right? Because they, and they have a proprietary, you know, knowledge behind that they want to keep. And I understand why. I mean, I'm not naive to go like that's how you generate capital. So I'm not completely naive. But, you know, in a post-capitalist politics, for example, you know, you can imagine us coming together and building. And again, I'm a geographer, and in geography, there's certain softwares that dominate North America, but you go south of the border into Mexico, and they use open source GIS all the time. The, we don't learn from the global south either. We have partners from the global south here. They're doing a lot more of this more actively than we are, and I think there's an opportunity. It's not going to be everywhere, but I think there's a moment, and I think the energy and impulse is there, and I can tell you the students we're training have that ethical interests, they come from these subject positions that suggest that we really need to tackle big problems. So let's grab that energy and ask them to try to do some of this work and share and engage and let us build together to address some of the things. And I think if we do that, we're going to find ourselves five years from now in a, in a really good place where technology really can be used to advance um, chal against challenges and close gaps and do those sorts of things. And yet? Yeah, well, how much time do I have now? I can keep it, maybe keep it short. Um, 
so first of all, of course, AI will continue to, to progress. I was a developer in the third generation, the narrow AI, and now we're in the generative AI. We're already working in the academia, especially on the fifth generation and of the, artifi of the AGI, the artificial general um, AI. Um, I think one domain which is very close to my heart is AI for education. I, there are so much things to do there in a responsible, ma ma responsible manner. First of all, I don't think AI will take everyone's jobs. I'm not, I'm not uh, part of this um, theory at all. There are many reasons for that, but I, I only tell them here. But education, it can be the big equalizer. Creating micro campaign and learning plan from every person, doesn't matter if they are from the Silicon Valley, Nebraska, Yemen, they can create you the perfect fit to your need, to your emotion, and upskill you for the workforce of tomorrow and maximize what she or he can do. So AI for education is a big thing. I see a big role of the university there as well to pave the way. And of course, companies like SAP and many others sell also learning solution and others to help upskill the future workforce generation. A second topic, which is, can be fortunate and unfortunate, but this will surely come, is the future of cybersecurity. The CIO spending, right? The, 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 the company pays the most in IT department in the recent two years on security product which is, by the way, not SAP business selling those uh, firewalls and anti-hacking business. But this is because a lot of progress happened with hacking, ransomware, and so forth. They're going to be light side solution and going to be some dark side. So we're going to see many of those coming forward. And today already you see uh, if I would need to add something to the curriculum of engineers, even in high school, security and privacy, not developing, but just dealing with a new paradigm of of hacking, what is fake, what is not, being a critical thinker regarding this. But also technology-wise, many breakthrough, homomorphic encryption, multi-part computation, I can geek out all day. And the last point, uh, I mentioned it briefly, I, I see in the recent years, big jump with quantum computing, we are still far away, but you see a step function in the interest and in what it can happen after COVID. The reason in very short words, some of you maybe know quantum, some of them not, it can solve, it's a new paradigm of computing. It can solve your type of partners, problems, especially around optimization, so all these supply chain problems or logistic, it can really help society by reduction of cost as well. So quantum, cybersecurity, and a general AI, in my favorite, especially for education, because there is so much to do in our nation and forward with that, is where I see the pack headed. Definitely agree, and especially as somebody who studied engineer many, many years ago, I wish I would have had more humanities classes. I wish I would have had different uh, opportunities to really explore some of these societal contexts um, as well. And, and as technology keeps evolving and now going into more on the quantum side, I think the opportunity is really ripe. And Sylvester, you're going to close this out because I think we're right at time. Uh, what is your moonshot? And, and you shared really great inspirational, and, but what is specifically from emerging technologies? You're like, this is where we have to, you know, have the opportunity to, to do it right. Uh, yeah, I, and keep this very short in, in less than a minute. I think uh, two, two things that I would hope for that I think will be difficult, but they're, they're attractive, they're, they're possible, and we should do them. And one is that the, uh, in order to create more accountability uh, among the, the makers of the technology, uh, which is, is a huge issue, I think the, the ethical governance of this technology, that, that leadership for the ethical governance has to come from pit-oriented, pit-like practitioners. They don't have to be members of this consortium, card-carrying car members, but it needs to be people who have that mission, that love for justice, and, and who are richly inclusive of what have been historically marginalized communities. They need to own and, and really be full participants in the ethical leadership. And that can't just be uh, giving talks, even though we need talks. That has to be participating in generating the products and services that's gonna make that possible. And I think there also has to be an emphasis on the, the shift from assuming that certain governments, uh, that, that the U.S. is gonna lead and control AI but so to make it accountable to, to American values, or that the West is gonna do that to make it accountable to Western values. Uh, most, anyone looking at our planet from a human rights perspective should be able to understand why that just is not a reliable way to try to explain how humans should be living on this planet. We need a truly humanistic approach to this. Right, and so if, if, the, if the social justice lovers, uh, those who are truly committed, 
can assume their leadership in governing AI ethically, and at a global level, if it truly becomes something transnational that all humans, and particularly that the global south, is participating in, then I, I think the next five years will be much more humane, that it will be much more just, it'll be much more equitable. And the capital needs to work in a way <laughs> that supports that movement of the leadership to those ethically committed communities and transnationally. So that's what I would hope would happen. And definitely making sure that the dollars are going behind it in a way that is incentivizing, definitely. I think we've seen uh, just this year, I think it's like 11 different uh, AI companies that each have raised over a billion dollars each, right? And so the level of capital that is flowing towards these types of solutions, it's, it's never been seen at this level. And so this is a, the call to action for the folks who are capital allocators to be able to be funding these types of uh, innovations at that level that is really required to, um, in this moment. So with that said, I, I got told that I have a little extra time. So now I'm gonna put the, the mic to you all. Um, we'd love to just open it up for about one to two, maybe two, two to two questions or so. Okay, thank you, Kip. Um, especially for this audience. So, if you guys have questions, this uh, the microphone will be walking towards you. Please raise your hand. And I, come on, come on, you gotta see some questions. All right, we got one right over there, and then one in the back. Hi, everybody. My name is Alina Yin, and my question is. Um, about technology that we have to support the process of civic participation in local government. So I'll go with the example of the city of San Jose. We, if you go into council chambers, it can seat maybe 400 people. But we're a city of a million. And we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of eligible voters. And we can't have 300,000 people on a Zoom call in a city council meeting. So literally, our governing systems are not designed for mass or full participation. It's always been just the select few who have time to come on a Tuesday afternoon or sit for an eight hour meeting. And so how is technology, the people in charge and academia, how are we looking at that problem? And how are we going to truly design a civic participation governing system where it's actually for the masses and not just the people with the privilege? So, um that goes all the way back to the Greek theater, I imagine. You know, <laughs> everyone was a citizen, but only the people who had time to show up were actually going to get uh, their voice heard. Um, so, an interesting way to think about this, actually, um, there's been a movement for the last 30 years in public participatory geographic information science of letting people really engage with their data and build maps together to show where there are challenges and so forth. They're, so they're actually really good models of civic engagement that are tech empowered and tech enabled. Um, I think there's more ways to create participatory um, opportunities then. The question really is, what do you do with all the information once you have it? How do you curate it? You know, what, what action comes from it? And you really then need a core of sort of ethnographic experts who can work on the ground. And that's something we miss in, in the technological conversations are those ethnographic opportunities, which means you need a workforce now to, to like sift through the data and really start to call it for what it's meaning. Now, there are certain tools that could do some of that, obviously. There's ways to create trends and other things, but you lose the kind of cultural politics and interpretive moments there. And the big, big question I think we struggle with in that, in that participatory moment is getting into a multilingualism that allows all these voices to use their authentic selves in the engagement. And that's another challenge that I think technology can definitely help us with, but there has to be an understanding of what those interpretive possibilities. But I think there are examples of this work out there uh, across the social sciences, for example, that could be leveraged, um, but it takes intentionality and consistency. I, I think it's a great question. In 2023, it was a big hit because we used to have a thing, I know it's, it was le just, last year, just last year, but it was a big part of what the metaverse, remembered the metaverse, tried to solve. We worked with several customers um, about smart country project. We heard about smart cities, but some of them smart countries, like we prototype, um, can give a lot of credit to the country of Dubai. They're very advanced in technology as well. So some of the use case we do 
is really how you can bring information, democratize it, of the entire country to everyone. So it was like a virtual reality when you can um, do many things. Uh, this problem haven't been solved yet, but I can tell you one very interesting example for what we implemented internally in SAP, where we hire 10,000s of people is in India, right? So when we onboard employee in India, 10,000 each year, um, this individual cannot meet all the executive and talk to them and learn about the company um, like in a one-on-one -on -one manner. So we build their avatars and with AI, sounds a bit scary, but it actually works. You can meet this person, get educated, you can have a conversation about the entire knowledge. So it's not like a Zoom call with 2,000 people. You can have one-to-one, -one, and this is the avatar of the person. Doesn't work perfectly yet, but it solved the problem that now you're a 21, 22 developer. You want to meet the entire C-suite and the managing director of India and the head of HR. You can do it either in a Zoom call, or you can do it when there, there is availability problem, because of course, they cannot meet 10,000 people each year. So last year, we did onboarding solution in, in India with an avatar and AI work pretty well with a smart country appetite and to bring this democratized information for everyone. I think it's a matter of time until we will get there. There is a lot of work on that. Still in prototype, the jury is still out there, but definitely a lot of demand from some countries and cooperate to do this kind of things. Very interesting as the way it's been developed and making sure we're centering the human in all of this experience. And I saw one question in the back and I think that'll be the last one. If you can raise your hand, I saw the question in the back. There we go. Yes. Hi, I just wanted to ask a question about AI in education. I'm currently a junior studying in Carnegie Mellon, um, and me and my team are trying to kind of um, implement this new like AI chatbot that prof can really help professors get into the loop of um, students using, using AI because we think that there's like a lack of visibility of what type of data is put into ChatGPT and what people are getting, what students are getting from those responses. But one um, kind of hurdle that we've been realizing as you, is un universities generally don't really have the infrastructure to um, like have these like in-house GPUs. Um, and that kind of restricts the data privacy, causing a lot of the data um, to not really stay into the university, but go out towards like the greater Google, like a search engine. So do you think that um, in the future, like universities in general would start to invest more in infrastructure to make AI more possible in like students' lives? This question's for you, Ben. We'll take it. <laughs> Working. Well, uh, it, it, it turns out that I actually wrote a little piece about this a little while ago, um, that I think the next great equity gap is, is a high performance commuting, super computing access, the ability for campuses to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, and what we're doing instead is pushing to the cloud because it's a, it's a less expensive, um, you know, sort of thing. And that's causing students and faculty and staff to go, where are my data going? what's happening with my data. So I don't have an answer, and I can tell you, it is not in the infrastructural funding of many public institutions to solve this problem. Um, this is, again, where the potential of a consortium could really do something. Could we create sites, nodes, where organizations could come together and try to capture some of that? But it is one, it, we're fortunate, we actually have high performance computing infrastructure at San Jose State. But you go right down the road to some of our other campuses and they do not, which means the students aren't even being trained in the kinds of spaces that they're gonna go to try and work in. And that is a real equity challenge. It's a real thing, um, even beyond even getting to the data, just having the spaces to be able to build and create and imagine and think. So I think it is one of the great questions and I think it's gonna take public-private partnership to really resolve, and, and I look to the community and go, if you want the next generation of people we educate to be able to work with you, you're gonna have to invest back to do the kinds of things you're talking about. But it's a big challenge for us, for sure. Sylvester, would you like to add to that as well? Yes, yeah, so I, will, I will say uh, there, there definitely needs to be a lot more investment on the, the accountability and ethical side. And 
and I, I find it interesting to re reflect on the creation of the National Endowment for Humanities and National Endowment for the Arts. So there was a U.S. Act of Congress in 1965 that created those institutions. It was very much a response to technology. Uh, this was the, 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 the space race was on, nuclear weapons race was ongoing. Uh, one of the great supporters of that Humanities Act was uh, Glenn Seaborg, who led the International Atomic Agency, uh, Atomic Agency, Atomic Energy Agency, uh, who was indicating that this progress in technology would never give us a time when computers could tell us what kind of decisions we should be making as a society, that we needed to invest in our ability as human beings to really figure out our societal problems and the direction of our society. And so that, that actually generated an investment in cre from the federal government in creating those um, endowments. Now, fast forward to today, <laughs> And, and what happened in between then and now is that a, a lot of money went to STEM education and technical things because that's how we were defining technology, is technical things and leaving out these human, these human things. We, we need a kind of moonshot level of investment in the ability to govern our technology in the comprehensive talent. And you're right, that, that, that capital uh, resource does not exist in certainly not in public, most public institutions, I'm not even sure uh, that our federal government alone has that kind of funding entirely, but there could be a significant contribution to it. There could be a reordering of priorities. If you look at our, our funding of things like defense on the one hand, and our funding of humanistic endeavors on the other, uh, Will I am was making a great point in a recent talk that he gave that he he's a philanthropist with the foundation and he's also a uh, an owner of multiple tech companies and he said that he raises it's it's easy for him to raise a lot of money for tech startups and it's so hard he's for AI he said it's so hard to raise money for HI for human intelligence to invest in human beings who need better funding in their schools so they can have the education that they need. So, so yes, we do need funding and investment on that side. It needs to be a kind of moonshot thing, and it needs to be on the human side. Definitely, uh, and with that, centering the human and all of this, and I'll just end with the reflection from one of my mentors when I, actually when I used to work down here at Accenture, it was one of those things, especially as being able to be in the labs, right, where you're working in some of this technology, you're not sure yet what it's gonna be about, but I remember just having the critical conversations of, should we, just because you can build it, should we build it? And just because we can scale it, should we scale it? And I think that we are at those everyday decisions, whether you're inside the labs or outside educating or in the communities, I think that those are some of the big decisions that we have to continuously, especially now going forward, making sure that we are investing in the right side of the technology, which is making sure that we're investing in, in, our, in our humanity and centering that. So with that said, please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much.